Good morning again, everyone. Well, all right. My name's Jared. I know many of you. So it is a a family Sunday again. Uh, we do family Sundays for a, a few reasons. I, I, on many of our Sundays, we, we separate out during the message kind of according to age. So the, the, the kids, kind of the, the younger kids go to different classes so we can teach the faith to them and help them understand Jesus on their mm-hmm. own level. And then we stay together as adults uh, to, to talk about the faith at, at a way that's suitable for adults. Um, and that's not because one of us is better than the other, but we, we all wanna follow Jesus and we all wanna learn the best way we can. So uh, there are young people that can know the faith, live out the faith better than any of us as adults by uh, believing the truths of Jesus and, and following him. Uh, but then on some Sundays, like Family Sundays, we, we all come together because we wanna proclaim that we all, young, old, are together as one body of Christ. The children aren't the future of the church, they are an essential part of the present of the church and they are part of our body and so we wanna be one body together and that's what we, we celebrate when we have family Sundays. It's also a communion Sunday, we wanna be one big family that comes together at the communion table at the end of the message. So the kids are with us. Uh, when the kids are with us, I try to have lots of props and things to open and adults seem to like that too for some reason. So everyone likes opening things, right? Um, all right, so we're talking about feet and our feet and the big story of the Bible or feet and the good news of Jesus. Last week I gave you a bunch of feet facts. Let's see if you remember from last week. Who's two, two types of people's feet grow the fastest? Anyone know? You can just shout it out. Teenagers and pregnant, Te- teenagers and pregnant women, that's right, yes. And um, if you need to, you can do all sorts of things with your feet. We talked about uh, people that live in different parts of the world where they, they live a lot of their life barefoot and climbing trees and their feet are shaped differently than folks who grow up you know, wearing shoes all the time and using, not using their feet. And you can even learn to do things like makeup and sewing with feet if you, if you have to or if you've been practicing since a child. I also said our feet have how many sweat glands? Does anyone remember that? 250,000 sweat glands and our feet make how much sweat a day? up to a pint a day. But like, almost like a big plastic water bottle worth of sweat a day. Who thought that sounded like a lot? That sounds like a lot. So I tested that this week. I've put a pair of socks on and I've tied my shoes up real tight and I've just worn one pair the whole week to keep and contain all the sweat and I wanted to do a little experiment and show how much sweat I have right now, okay? So, I have this bowl up here. Got my socks. Let's see, because this, sh- all right, let's see what we got. Oh, all right. All right, let's see. That's way less. It's not seven pints of water. I'm, I'm disappointed. I'm not as sweaty as I thought I was. All right, praise God. All right, now I'm barefoot and it's wet up here. Okay, so we talked about feet. I wanna review last week's feet and then we'll dive into this week's feet and uh, Jenna, our children's men director, did a great drawing to give us kind of an overview and hopefully you can see it. I'll try to get into the light here. Goodness gracious me. All right, so quick, super fast recap. The slides will be on the screen. First picture is of feet. Who made you? The Christian confession, the Christian belief is God made you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made by a God who formed you from the dirt and the dust of the ground and made you in his image. A God of love, not a God of violence. The other other stories that were being told around the time of of uh, when Genesis was, was written, um, we're, we're arguing that there's these gods and they're violent and the humans were formed out of the blood of the gods or the, the humans uh, were made to be slaves of God. And the big story today in our day and age is that we're kind of made by chance or we're random. There's no personal God controlling the universe, but we just kind of exist and we kind of came without any purpose and this, everything's kind of random. And to that, the Christian confession says, no, 
You're fearfully, wonderfully made. You're made by a God of love. You're made in the image of that God. So when God made you, he made a good thing. That was the first thing. And then remember the second image? Anyone remember it? Go ahead, Ash. A foot getting bitten by a snake. Yeah, we're snake bitten. And that, that story, there's this poison, this evil that enters the world. And it's depicted in the, the Genesis story. There's this curse on humanity where the, the snake's going to bruise the heel or bite the heel. And it, not just are we snake bitten with this poison, which is called sin or evil. And we look at the world and there's, there's things that are wrong. Uh, it's not just that we have a little bit of problem. Uh, our feet are swift to shed blood. That poison has overtaken our hearts our minds, our words, and, and you look at the world, right? There's, there's pain, there's suffering, there's hurt, there's evil, there's injustice all around. And the, the, the story the scriptures tell is humanity quickly, as, as we're snake bitten by this poison of sin, we're just, we have feet that are swift to shed blood. Like everything about us at times just goes and bends towards this evil. Uh, but then we said there's this God who doesn't give up on humanity. This God who calls people, continues to call people, calls people like Abraham and Moses and says, walk before me, walk in my ways. I wanna show the world, I wanna show those human feet how they're called to live, how I made them to live. But there's this problem, there's this sin, this evil, this poison, so as he calls people, they make mistakes. And uh, we see in the kind of the defining story of the Old Testament is when God delivers an enslaved people, his people Israel, from the bondage of the Pharaoh in Egypt. There's this defining story where we see that this God who creates and loves and these humans who go away and are sinful and evil, we find that this God loves so much and he's powerful enough to save people, to save and deliver people trapped in that sin and poison. And God has this real heart for oppressed feet, feet that are under pain and bondage. And he delivers uh, Israel from Pharaoh and his army and they walk through the dry ground. God actually parts the waters and lets feet, lets hurting feet walk through on dry ground, and then he crushes the feet of the oppressors and, and drowns Pharaoh's army. And there's this good news. God saves. God loves to save people who are hurting. But then there's more bad news. The people that he saves, they quickly start worshiping other gods. They quickly have feet that run to do evil. They have feet that say, we want to take those feet and run back to, Is- to Egypt. We actually want to go back into slavery. We don't want to take our feet to this new land that you're going to show us. We want to go back to the slavery that we used to know. And then God actually brings them into a good place, a better place. And when they get power, they become oppressors. They start doing evil. There's this pain, this sin. God even gives them a law. He's like, here's my revealed law. Here's some ways to go. Here's commandments to follow. And the human heart continues to devise evil in our thoughts and our mouth and our actions. There's this, this way that stays swift to shed blood. The poison can't be taken out for some reason. The poison feels so permanent. So finally, the Christmas story, right? Six, what we have, we have, this is the foot of Jesus comes and touches the ground. God, Jesus, the son of God, enters in. He comes down to be with the humans stuck in the poison and sin. And this Jesus, he goes around, he serves, he heals, he loves. We have this scene, uh, the, the towel and the basin, he washes his disciples' feet even as those people betray him, right? He heals, he loves, he serves. He goes around touching people who have the poison in them and they're healed and they're restored. He's kind of pointing all of these signs back to creation and forward to a possibility of a new creation where this poison is removed. He's giving all these signs and wonders. And as he serves and loves and heals, all the poison and sin and evil comes upon him. He loves his followers and he, he says, I'm gonna die for you and he washes their feet and their feet run away from him and then some of their feet are swift to betray him and then some of the feet of the religious leaders are swift to have him crucified and some of the feet of the Roman leaders are swift to have him killed and then we come to the, the eighth symbol which was Jesus' feet are pierced on the cross. So this holy one, God himself comes, shows us the way of love of healing, of peace, of goodness, of of new creation. And all of our sinful hearts get together and want him crucified. And the good news of the cross is that all of our evil can't overcome him. In fact, God uh, puts all the sin upon him. Uh, In the early church, they said, God made him who knew no sin, this perfect one, to be sin for us. So all the poison was placed on him so that we might have the righteousness 
We might have the goodness. We might have the just and holy way of God. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we might have this righteousness. So God takes it all on and gives us all of his goodness. Uh, Peter, one of the first followers of Jesus, and he's quoting Isaiah, he says, uh, you know, uh, by his wounds we are healed. There's this good news. And then we closed last week, last week by, by bookending what happened in two, right? This, this snake bite that seems so permanent. And then, but Jesus crushes the head of the serpent. He overpowers evil. His, his cross, and we'll see today, his resurrection has the power to overcome evil. And that brings us up to today. So many of these are scenes from the Old Testament or scenes from the Gospels where Jesus comes and breaks in. But the story of feet doesn't stop there. Uh, Paul, one of the followers of Jesus, uh, again, he was a guy who was swift to shed blood, hated Jesus. Jesus blinds Paul on his way to, to persecute Christians, knocks him off his donkey and sets him on a new path and walking. Paul's describing kind of the story I just explained. And he says, uh, we were all trapped in the trespasses of sin and death. We were following the sinful ways, the, the, the Satan ways, the poisonous ways. But God is rich in mercy out of the great love with which he loved us. It's by grace he has saved us. He's done all these things. By grace we're saved. And then he says, uh, by grace we're saved through faith, not in what we've done, but what in Jesus has done for us. And then he says this line, and this is in Ephesians 2.10, he says, uh, for we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. He says, we're made for these good works. And this phrase, way of life, is this Greek word, peripateo. Can you say it with me, peripateo? Peripateo. It, it look, peripateo, good job. I think we have a picture of it. There we go. That's how it looks in Greek. Um, it means to walk, right? We have that, this symbolism, this metaphor, right? Uh, kind of what road are you on? What path are you taking? Which way are you walking? Uh, this literally means the way you walk. So this prepared beforehand to be your way of life is the term for walk. It's a feet term. Like, how are you going to walk? There are good ways that you're called to walk. So today we're going to look at uh, followers of Jesus what are the different ways we're called to walk? What are the different types of feet we're called to have as we seek to follow Jesus together? So, first one, who wants to open up the first box? All right, Nadine, come on up. All right. Right there. No, number one. All right. It's not go, go, squeeze. That's just a trick. It's applesauce, yay. All right, so what is this? Do you know what these are? Mm, I think those are those. All right, yeah, that's an, un okay. So you wanna show that to people and ask people what that is? What is this, people? Does anyone know what these are? You can shout it out. Yeah, so these are Russian nesting dolls, right? Anyone seen these in their life? You all look very confused. I'm pretty sure these are well-known items, right? Okay, good. So yeah, so you, you, there's these Russian nesting dolls. Okay, so Nadine, I want you to do something for me. Okay. This is a Jesus Russian nesting doll that Jenna also drew for us. Why don't you do something? Would you write your name on this one? And then you can go sit down. Okay. All right. There you go. Try to keep it together. Great job. Thank you, Nadine. Give Nadine a hand. Woo! Thank you, Nadine. That was good. Okay, so I have Russian nesting dolls. We'll get back to that. Oh, real quick. If, so I got these ones that weren't painted. This isn't quite connected to the sermon, but I'm just giving you some advice here. Um, if you want your own Russian nesting dolls, the reason I bought these ones, who's not a good painter? Doesn't think they can do this, right? All right. When I went on Amazon, I bought these ones because they had a simple three-step pattern 
on how to paint your own Russian nesting dolls. So I wanna just show that for you. This is just my free advice to you. I'll give you the link if you wanna use these and figure it out. So the three simple steps. Step one, grab the egg that you bought, hold it up. Step two, put paint on it. <laughs> Step three, look at this. There it is. <laughs> I'm not making this up. Go to the next picture. They give you a simple three-step process. Uh, my wife's an art teacher. I don't know why she's never shown us this three-step process to paint these beautiful Russian nesting dolls. There it is, three steps. Step day one, step day two, step day three. All right, so if you wanna paint these beautiful Russian nesting dolls, come see me and I'll, I'll share with you how to get that three-step process. All right. There's a scene at the end of the Gospels, the Gospel of Matthew. After the Sabbath, Jesus has been dead. He's in, in, the, in the tomb. It was, the first day was dawning. Mary Magdalene and another Mary went to see the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake. An angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He's been risen. He said, this is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy, and they ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them and said, greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet, and worshiped him. And then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. We ended with last week where Jesus crushes the head of the serpent. And Jesus takes our sin upon him on the cross and we're given his righteousness. But the power of the cross and the resurrection not only conquers the power of sin, it also overcomes the power of death. In the resurrection, the power of Jesus wins victory over death. Death cannot hold Jesus. So that sin in the garden that so, seems so permanent in the Garden of Eden, right, that leads to death, right? The wages of sin is death, but this gift of God is eternal life through Christ our Lord. There is not just one who has defeated the power of sin in our lives and removed the poison, but there's also one who conquers death. That means we are made to have resurrection feet. The scriptures talk the early church, they talk all the time about being, they use this phrase, and it says, in Christ. It means to be in Christ. They talked about that a lot. They're like, I've come to believe in Jesus. I believe he saved me. I believe he died for me. I believe he rose again. And now I am in him. And they say, like, I'm part of the, we talk about that here. I'm part of the body of Christ, right? I'm in Christ. So this is the Jesus Russian nesting doll, right? And in this Jesus, we have Nadine, right? Now, if I'm striking this Jesus, right? If I'm hitting this Jesus, if I'm piercing this Jesus, if I've crucified this Jesus, who's getting hit? The doll. Yes, the Jesus part though, right? Yeah. Who's getting hit? The Jesus nesting doll, right? If this Jesus dies, who dies? The doll. Well, Jesus and, and Nadine and everyone. And Paul talks about this. Paul says... And he's looking at what happened on the cross. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. So I, when Jesus gave himself for me, when Jesus died for my sin, I have been also crucified with him. But he also says things like, where, O oh, death, is your sting? Where, hell, where, O oh, grave, is your victory, right? In Christ, the early church came to believe he took the pain, he took the sin, he took the suffering, the, the sin of the sting of sin, the sin, sting of death, but we were crucified with him. So that old life, Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ, and that's my old life, and the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So when Jesus is raised, when Jesus is resurrected, when Jesus ascends to heaven, when Jesus uh, is resurrected, right? Who's resurrected? All who are in him, right? So he takes the burden, the shame, the sin, right? Like the, his body takes it all while we're in him. And while we die with him, we don't feel the stain. We don't, we don't take on the burden, the pain that he takes on. 
But when he's resurrected, when he's in new life, when he ascends to heaven, we're in him. So we go with him. We're made for resurrection feet. You're made to be in him. In the new creation, you can be in him. So the old can be passed away and the new can come in and you can be in him. You're made for resurrection feet. All right, number two, I had this from the first service, but it's very lame, so I'm not even using it. Well, I'm going to show it to you. Image two is a foot bath. What are these called? Uh, foot, spa. foot spa. Yes, very nice. We are called to have baptism feet. In the nine o'clock service, I didn't have a good illustration for that. In the 1030, we have central to the side of the sanctuary, a huge baptismal. So there's already an image there. Um, The Jesus followers spread the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection. The poison is removed. The curse is done. And all kinds of people can come to Jesus. When you proclaim that you believe in him, you're like, yes, I know he died for me. He's taken taken away my sin. I'm now in him, so my old life is gone in him. And now I live this new life, this new creation life. I'm going to find resurrection and the new heaven and the new earth in him. The next step when you believe that is to walk into the waters of baptism. If you believe that, we want to help you take that next step in faith and lead you to the waters of baptism. And and you you symbolize, like, yeah, I've been walked through the waters. I've been dying to my old life, and I want to be resurrected to this new life. And the Christian church, the early church, and the church since then has had this symbol of baptism to proclaim that. And baptism is for all who believe. There's not barriers anymore. There's these stories in in the Acts of the Apostles. This is kind of the story of the early church unfolding after Jesus rises from the grave. And there's a story about an Ethiopian eunuch. And the interesting thing is this Ethiopian is nowhere near the people of Israel. Like in uh, Ethiopia was actually probably, in the times of the pharaohs, Ethiopia might have been part of the Egyptian empire. And there's, there's some, some belief historically that, that the Ethiopians were part of the, even leaders in some of the Egyptian empire. So this Ethiopian eunuch uh, is starting to read about the God of Israel and he's reading the prophet Isaiah and he meets one of Jesus' followers, a guy named Philip. And he's actually reading about kind of the suffering servant. He's like, who is this guy? What's going on? Can someone explain this to me? And Philip explains, like, the suffering one came. He suffered and died for you. He gave himself for the world. He's risen. You can believe in him. You can follow him and, and come be baptized. And they come to this pool of water, and he says, is there anything keeping me from being baptized? And that's a real question. He's like, they both would have known the story. Like, hey, we were kind of enemies. We're not friends, Right? You usually have your, you know, in that world, you have your God, I have my God, we fight, we war. They would have known their own history. Like, hey, I was part of the Egyptian group and we were fighting with you guys and enslaving you guys and we don't get along. He says, no, there's nothing keeping you from being baptized. Christ has given himself for all. And then this uh, Ethiopian is baptized. There's another story. Uh, Paul and Silas, these early followers of Jesus, these leaders, they're imprisoned with other people. And there's a, a man from Philippi, a Philippian jailer, and these are hard scrabble guys, soldiers, tough guys with a job to do, a guy who would look down on the Jewish religion, and he's holding these people prisoner, and he's kind of in charge of them, and there's this earthquake, and the, the doors are, 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 are thrown open, and the chains are broken off, and he realizes what's happened is those people are going to be running away and set free, and that means he'll probably be executed by the state. So he's about to take his own life and Paul and Silas cry out like, don't don't hurt yourself. We're all here. We're not leaving you. And the guy comes in. He washes up their wounds and he says, what do I need to do to be saved? And that night he wakes up his family. He feeds these people that had been his captives, these enemies who loved him when he was at the point of death and and saved his life by not running away. Uh, And and he's what I need to be saved. And and Paul says, you and your family get baptized. And there's nothing preventing them. They they put their trust in this God that Paul shows them about. They put their trust in this Jesus and what he's done for them. And they get baptized. We're called to have baptism feet. We declare publicly what Christ has done for us. And we come to the waters of baptism. If you haven't been baptized, talk to us. Talk to me or Pastor Steve or Pastor Russ. We want to help you take those next steps. Make sure you understand this. Uh, go over this story we've been going over the last two weeks and and guide you in the best ways for your feet to walk in the days ahead, and we want to baptize you and celebrate that together. So we're called to have baptism feet. Number three. Um, What's number three? Okay. Oh, yes. All right. Who likes soccer? 
Who likes World Cup so- Who's watched the World Cup years ago? All right. Who likes making loud, obnoxious noises? <laughs> Nadine, you already come up. <laughs> she, I know she did already go. Who else, who else went already? Who came up second? Um, no. No. Yeah, you. Oh, or only on the second one. All right, Ash, you can come up for this. Go ahead. So this is the second one. Yes, correct. <laughs> A box. It is a box. Okay, so what do we got? A giant shoe. All right. And these things. Does anyone remember what these are called? Oh my gosh. Oh, what's the term? Hold on. No, I don't like it. Anyone remember that? Remember the world? Anyone watch the World Cup when everyone's blasting those loud noises? All right, so we have, hold on. We have a stinky running shoe, and we have vuvuzelas. You can go and make, you want to make noise with it real quick. All right, good. All right. Wait, what if I yell mine into yours we'll, and then it'll be We will practice that afterwards. That's a great idea. All right, you can take them. Just give one to your friends. Okay. Cousins, there you go. Don't blow them until we're done. Until I call upon you to do so. All right, so good news feet. In that, that scene, right? They left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. That's Matthew 28, 8. Some, some women see that Jesus is risen and they run. They run to go and tell the good news. There's another scene at the end of Luke. These two people meet Jesus, and they run back to go tell the disciples. There's other scenes where uh, John and Peter run to go tell the others, and they run, and then they proclaim. We're called to have good news feet where we are called to be heralds of this good news. If this news is true, it's the best news for everyone who's hurting and suffering in this world, that there's a God who loves us so much he came to die for us, to take away that sin and hurt, and he's risen. So we're called to have feet that are swift to run and tell the good news, right? In the old way, we had feet that were swift to do damage, to shed blood, to do evil. But now in Christ, as we're in him, as we've had baptized feet, we're called to have feet that are swift to go and proclaim the good news. Like, like crazed soccer fans shouting out with zoos, vuvuzelas, vuv, I don't, vuvuzelas, yes. Vuvuzelas. Good news feet. Next one. I have the basin and the towel again. Serving feet. Jesus came to heal, to serve, to love. Before he's crucified, he gathers those disciples, and we looked at this last week, and he washes their feet. And after he's done washing their feet, he says, uh, you know, uh, um, an apprentice isn't higher than his master, right? Uh, um, but I, as the master, I, as your rabbi, I, as your leader, have washed your feet. You also ought to go and wash one another's feet. And Jesus says, you know, whoever wants to be uh, greatest becomes a servant of all. Take up your cross, follow me. He leads, he serves. Followers of Jesus are called to serve called to serve those who are hurting in this world, called to serve one another, called to serve their neighbor, right? We're called to have feet that are swift to proclaim the good news in words. We're also called to have feet that proclaim the good news of a different world in how we love and serve. In in Matthew 25, there's this incredibly powerful passage where Jesus talks about separating the nations and he says, whatever you did to the least of these, those who were hungry, those who were thirsty, those who needed clothing, those who were stuck in prison and slavery and bondage, whatever you did to the least of these, you did unto me. The way of our feet in Jesus is the way of giving ourselves and serving others. Next one, I have the nail from last week. Um, Suffering feet. Feet that follow Jesus will suffer. Jesus' feet were pierced. Jesus, no one loved, healed, served more faithfully than Jesus and he suffered for it. Everyone turned on him. He says things like, the world will hate you. He says things like, take up your cross and follow me. The cross is an instrument of suffering and torture. He tells his followers, my way is going to involve suffering and hurt. Um, The first followers of Jesus 
most of them were crucified or martyred in some way or at least put in exile for following Jesus. So part of the path to follow Jesus involves taking on more suffering. Um, I, I kind of like to think of it, if you've seen the Grinch, the Grinch at the end, the Grinch who stole Christmas, everyone, yes, you okay? Um, his heart kind of grows three sizes at the end. I, I think when we embrace the way of Jesus and follow him and trust him, uh, and the Holy Spirit gets a hold of our lives, we, we expand our hearts, our capacity to love, and that expands your ability to suffer and come alongside people and, and hurt and ache with them. Uh, when I was, uh, I was younger, I was involved in a student ministry and spent a lot of time with high school students and middle school students and then a lot of young 20-somethings and I was in my mid-20s or so. And at one point, I realized I knew three people who had died tragically, three young people, you know, 15 and then two in their 20s, um, who died unexpectedly and, and, and really tragically in the course of like two years. And as I was sitting at, like, at a third funeral and thinking about that, I thought, I only know these people because I'm part of a church community where we're trying to love and serve and come alongside people. I realized these are three people, they weren't part of, and there's hurt and pain going on in families and there's hurt and pain going on in friendships, but these weren't young people that I grew up with. Like, I didn't have a long-term friend who died unexpectedly. I didn't have this family member who died unexpectedly. Uh, we had chosen to be part of a church where we were intentionally trying to come alongside young people who were hurting and going through difficult things in life. And I just thought, the only reason I know these people and I'm feeling this pain and hurt and this frustration with how messed up things are in the world is because I'm a follower of Jesus. So we're, we're willingly choosing to get into the mess and life of others, right? When you're part of a church community, one of the commands is to bear one another's burdens, right? We're praying for each other. We're hearing about the suffering and hurt of other people. We're choosing to get involved and love and pray for more and more people who are hurting and suffering. And that leads to the way of Jesus and it involves more suffering and pain and hurt. So suffering feet. The next one I don't have an image for, um, but it's fearless feet. Walking with Jesus can be hard and scary. We'll be afraid at times. But if we are with Jesus, we don't need to be afraid. In fact, we can take big risks for Jesus. So I want to tell you the story uh, about a man who takes a big risk for Jesus and is also afraid, and he's a good combo, this man Peter. So Jesus has been doing his thing, healing and helping people. At the end of the day, he sends his, his disciples to get in a boat to go to the other side of the lake. Jesus goes and prays at night in the mountains, which is how Jesus likes to do things. He goes and prays to God at night in the, in the mountains. And they get on the water, and there's a storm in the middle of the night, and I'll, I'll pick up from there. When evening came, Jesus is alone, but by this time, the boat that the disciples are on is battered by the waves. It was far from land. The winds were against it. Early in the morning, he, Jesus, came walking toward them on the sea. The disciples saw him walking on the sea and they were terrified saying it's a ghost and they cried out in fear, which this isn't absolutely insane. They have in their story, their history, a God who can part the waters. And now they're kind of seeing the next step of that. There's not just a God who can part the waters. There's a God whose feet can walk above the waters, not even parting the storm, but in the middle of the storm, being above it and being able to walk and have power over it. Immediately, Jesus spoke to them, told them it's him. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So, Pete, so Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and started walking on the water and came towards Jesus. There are human feet who have cast their eyes upon Jesus, asked Jesus to put a call on their life, and then took steps and walked upon the water. That's what this gospel proclaims. Not just Jesus walking on the water, but someone has fixed their eyes upon Jesus in that they've been able to take the step out of the boat, to take a big risk with their feet to walk upon the water with Jesus. He said, come. He got out of the boat. He started walking. Then he noticed the strong wind. He became frightened and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out of his hand and caught him, saying to him, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? They got into the boat, the wind ceased. Jesus got into the boat, the wind ceased. And they worshiped him saying, truly this is the son of God. We have feet that are going to be afraid. We have feet that are gonna see the storms. 
But we have feet that don't need to be afraid if Jesus is who he says he is. If he's conquered death and hell, he's the one who can walk upon the waters. When we are in storms, we can take risks. We're called to be a people that have feet that go take risks for the sake of following Jesus. And we will be people that then see what's around us and start to drown. And then we put our eyes back on Jesus and cry out, Lord, save me. He's faithful and good and he does save us. Paul, who I keep mentioning, right? Paul was actually shipwrecked in a storm. He didn't walk on water. He was caught in a storm. The boat sank. They barely survived. They got on land. That same Paul was then bit by a snake. That actually physically happened to him, right? He's not just, I'm snake bitten with sin. I actually had a physical snake bite me at some point. He got beaten with lashes. He's eventually, cruci- he's eventually um, martyred in Rome. I think he's beheaded. He had a life of suffering and hurt for following Jesus. Uh, but he says these words about Jesus. And he says about life in Jesus and why we don't need to be afraid. And I've asked Sam to, to read those for us. So just hear these words. Thank you, Sam. We have feet that need not be afraid, and we can take big risks for Jesus. We have two more. Would someone like to come up? Who hasn't come up yet? All right, Gabs, you want to come up? All right. Careful. Open that up. Grab six of those and hand them out that are open. Can you tell people what this is? Wait, open? Uh, take ones that have them. There you go. Three. All right, do you know what that is? Can you tell people what it is? Um, this is some... Do you know what it's called? Oil? It's oil. What's it called? I don't know. Can you say nard? nard? Can you say nard? Nard? Can you say this is pure nard? This is pure nard. This is pure nard from Jerusalem. All right. Thank you, Nadine. Uh, thank you. Thank you, my daughter, Gabby. <laughs> it's Gabby, right? It's dark up here. I know she said... She, I know. I know it's Gabby. This is pure nard from Jerusalem. I know Amazon wouldn't trick me. Um, I want to share this story. We're, we're called to have feet that worship. Six days before the Passover, so close to when Jesus is going to be crucified, he came to Bethany. He's at the home of Lazarus, the, the one he raised from the dead, and his sisters, Mary and Martha. They gave the dinner for him. Martha served. Lazarus was one of those at the table. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard anointed Jesus' feet and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. So pure nard is, 
Uh, what she had was probably worth a year of salary. This is her savings, this is her security, this is her equity. This is something you would put your trust in, right? Your nest egg. Like this is the thing you own that you're gonna protect, right? She has this thing of value. It's thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars. It's hundreds upon hundreds of days of work to have this pure nard. She takes it, she breaks it, she anoints Jesus' feet and she starts wiping uh, his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance. Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who's gonna betray him, says, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and he, was, he held onto the purse for them. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with me, but you do not always have me. She takes this valuable thing, this thing that costs her a lot, this thing that she puts a lot of safety and security in and brings it and puts it at the feet of Jesus. She uses what she has to worship Jesus. This isn't a talk about money, per se, but we are called to take our time, our energy, our money, our resources, and use them for the sake of worshiping Jesus. We have feet that are made to worship him. In Christ, uh, in this in Christness, in this new way, we can move toward the new creation way, which was our original creation way, which is we are called to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself. That's, uh, that's what we are made to be and what in Christ we can work towards becoming. And we go further up and further into that as we live and follow Jesus. And I think uh, Mary's example here is so beautiful. Um, because what we spend our heart on, what we spend our mind on, what we spend our money on, what we spend our time on are the things that we worship, the things we trust for this life. And Mary takes so much of that and she takes this pure nard, this precious thing, and she gives it and puts it at the feet of Jesus. And we're called to do the same. We're called to use our money, time, talents, treasures for the sake of investing in Jesus and his mission and, and surrendering them to Jesus. Because that's what we're made for, to use what we have for the sake of proclaiming and worshiping Jesus. I, I love this because uh, when we do that, um, this worship is a witness to the world, right? Um, that nard, she brings her treasure to Jesus, gives it to Jesus, hands it at the feet of Jesus, serves Jesus with it, and it's a fragrance that empowers and, and hits the whole room. We were pouring these out last night, and my fingers still smell like nard. It's, it's a good smell. It's a weird smell, but it's a good smell. We have more. You can come up and grab one at the end. All right, last one. Who hasn't come up yet? Els, you want to come up? You know what these are? Hey, you brought, what is that? Oh, your nard? You want to open these? Did you put a ring on the nard? Neat. Okay. Open the other one too. I'm going to steal one real quick. Okay. Can you tell people what these are? Rings. They are rings. Can you hand those? Or wait till the end and then give them to okay. your friends at the end. Okay. These are rings. Um, Pastor Russ does a good job with this at every wedding. Uh, rings are this symbol used for weddings because they're kind of the symbol of eternity. And those are toe rings I gave you, so don't try to put them on your finger because they'll fit your smaller toes probably. Um, they fit kind of this eternal thing, right? This marriage covenant, this marriage commitment, this, this ring is a symbol of something that has a love that has no beginning or end, but it's kind of this eternal thing. Um, our feet are made for eternity. We're called to have eternal feet. And this is um, at the end of the, the book of Revelation, the last kind of book in our, in our New Testament. Uh, hear these words, and this is a vision that John gets about the new heaven and new earth. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. So 
He enters this city, and we usually have a temple, or we usually have a great giant building that's the center, like in our world, the center of commerce in New York City, or in these ancient worlds, these giant temples, or in a a local town, a big church building, or a big municipal building, right? He goes into this city, and there's nothing. There's no central temple. For its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb, and the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on. The other things that people worshiped, you looked up to the heavenly bodies, there's no sun, there's no moon. For the glory of God is its light, and the lamp is the lamb. So the light of the world is God Almighty, and this lamb who has been crucified from the foundations of the earth, this lamb symbolizing this Jesus is the lamb, right? They're there, and they're the light. It says, the nations will walk, peripateo, the nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. It's talking about us, all of those who are in Christ from every tribe, tongue, nation. We have feet that are made for eternity. We're made to be in that space where we walk into this beauty of the eternal city where God is light itself and he wipes away every tear from every eye and Christ the lamb is there. And we're called to bring, the kings bring, the king of the nations bring their glory into it. We're called to bring all of our treasure and all of ourselves into this place. The gates will never shut by day. So there's no fear, right? There's no fear. Fear is feet because you shut gates at night to protect enemies because there's no more enemy to defeat. The enemy is defeated. And there will be no night there because people will bring it to the, the uh, there'll be no night there. People will bring the glory and honor of the nations. But nothing unclean will enter it nor anyone who practices abomination or falsehood, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. It's this place where the poison has been completely cast aside. And there's this powerful, overwhelming good news of life eternal, eternal feet in the presence of our eternal king and and the one full of love and grace and truth and mercy and goodness. And there's sad news in this and that, 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 uh, the good news that the evil is done away, the sad news if people live and stay in that evil, they miss this. And so that's why we're called to be bearers of the good news and love and word and deed because we're made for eternity. Look at those stinky feet again. You can look at your feet. Those are feet made by God. They are feet that have been poisoned by sin, but they're not that feet that are made for that. Those are feet that can be in Jesus, feet that can be forgiven, feet that can be fully healed by the blood of the cross, feet that can be in Jesus and find new life in his resurrection. You have feet that are made to serve. You have feet that are made to run and tell the good news. You have feet that are made to worship. You are feet that are made to take risks without fear, and you have feet that are eternal. I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to come to the communion table and be reminded again uh, in this form all the goodness of what God has done for us on the cross as his feet were crucified for us so that we have feet that can live for him. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, I thank you for this day that we can be together as a body, that we can worship you in song, that we can pray to you, that we can know you. Lord, show yourself to us. Stir in our hearts. Use our imperfect words, our imperfect abilities. Make your strength known in our weaknesses. God, show yourself to us. Overwhelm us with your love and your grace and your mercy and your truth and goodness. Build us up, equip us, fill us, help us find all the truth we need to find in you. Help us follow you and walk in your ways as the way, the truth, and the life. Be with us now as we come to this communion table. It's in your name we pray, amen.